Good morning. Ten years ago, my mother-in-law, Shirley, received the most amazing life-saving innovation with a kidney transplant. What was more remarkable than the transplant itself was how she received the kidney. She went into a kidney network, kind of like a registry program. And through this network, they found a match for her, looking all across the Pacific Northwest. And it was a match that would give her the best possible clinical outcomes. And this is significant because last year alone, there were 30,000 people that received a kidney transplant. But there's four times that number, 120,000 people that are waiting on a list for a kidney. So people are dying every day waiting. Fast forward 10 years, and Shirley is now 76 years old. She actually just had a birthday yesterday. And she's starting to feel very tired every day and not able to keep up with her normal social activities. She's a member of three book clubs and a salt and pepper shaker club. So for those of you who aren't doing that yet, you're still probably playing Pokemon Go. But it's a big thing on the West Coast, so that's what's coming up next. Come to find out, her kidney's only functioning at about 20%. So she needs a more thorough medical evaluation, and I'm selected by the family to go with her to the Kidney Transplant Center, which is about a two and a half drive from her home. Once we arrive there, we have a full day worth of assessments, starting out with, is she gonna be able to afford this kind of surgery and the handfuls of medication that she would be taking on a regular basis to keep the organ working? And how is she doing emotionally with the ups and downs of having this kind of a condition? And finally, after the end of a very long day, we met with the kidney specialist, the nephrologist, and he very compassionately told her that it would take more than five years to find a match. And because of her declining health, she was really gonna be at high risk to have a heart attack or stroke either before, during, or after a potential transplant. So he did not recommend her for a second kidney transplant. Shirley and I were pretty distraught after he left the room and with tears going down both of our faces, she looked at me and she said, I failed. I reflected on that and thought, you know, she really felt she let the whole family down. She felt this was a test. And on the long drive home, I thought more about what we in healthcare had done for her. We won the day. For her and for 30,000 other people with a kidney transplant. The opportunity for us in healthcare is to win the journey. It's to go beyond these point innovations to those periods in between where people are living their lives and looking to improve their life experience. It's giving them tools to live their lives more fully and to take it from running this long marathon that Shirley had been under over the last 10 years and to get up and have the energy to enter another race. So that's the opportunity for us today is to win that journey. And here's how we're thinking about it at Providence. We think that there's three key elements to a successful innovation program. For one, what, what are you trying to do with innovation? What is it in service to? Secondly, how are you inviting the outside in? And thirdly, how are you just getting started? in one of the most complex and regulated industries in the world.
studies are showing that half of all healthcare workers are not fully engaged in their work. So I know engagement is a really overused word in healthcare right now. And what is it really? So I did a little bit of research and I came across a definition I really like. So we'll see what you think. And it comes from Dr. Zinta Byrne. And she calls it a state of motivation where employees are psychophysiologically aroused. Psychophysiologically aroused about their work. So I don't know about you, but I want to work with other people who are psychophysiologically aroused. And I want people taking care of me that are psychophysiologically aroused. How about you? Yeah? Yeah? So let's unpack this word a little bit. So it's the state of motivation, so there's a focus and an energy where all of your emotional energy is being channeled toward transforming work that makes it more meaningful and purposeful. And what I like most about this definition is that it assumes that this state of arousal is something that lives in every one of us. It just needs to be activated. It needs to be turned on. And we at Providence think that this sense of arousal is a catalyst for innovation. And here's how we've turned it on for our employees. Over a three-year period, we presented corporate challenges to our employees in Oregon. And it went about this way. We presented, here are all of healthcare's biggest problems. We would like each of you employees, and it wasn't just something directed to strategic planners or the C-suite or the digital innovation team, something directed to everyone in the organization, an open invitation. Well, here's healthcare's biggest problems. How, what are your best ideas for solving them? We posted all of their solutions on the intranet so everyone could participate. Then we asked every employee to vote for the proposals that would provide the most promise for them, that they felt held the most promise. And what we found is that one out of every three employees voted online. And it was all real time so people could see the results. These proposals, we funded about half a million dollars over collectively over three years to fund 26 of those projects. And those projects had savings of almost $3 million. And they were asked to show how do these not only provide and make healthcare more affordable, but how also do they improve life experience and how do they improve clinical quality? So they were asked to demonstrate all of those things. And the majority of these projects expanded to other areas in Oregon. Or the business unit said, okay, I'm gonna build on this proposal and iterate a little bit more. So the lesson here is create a challenge. Tie it to strategy, put some guardrails around it. Share it across the whole organization and go for it. My very first boss in innovation was a woman named Kitty Powell. And she was a Stanford MBA. She was a very successful entrepreneur in the Silicon Valley. And she had no healthcare background. One of the first things she said to me was, Gwen, all these other industries that I've worked in have the same problems <laughs> that healthcare has. And they've already went through some of the struggles and obstacles, and they have some solutions, some different tactics and strategies that we could use. I think it would be great if we invited them in and had an inspirational discussion about, you know, about innovation. So our speaker series was born on that day. And over the last five years, we've had many, many speakers. And I'm gonna share a few of my favorites with you. We had the chief financial officer from Portland General Electric who came to visit us. This is a 125-year-old company. 
large established company, and Providence is a 160-year-old company going through rapid changes. New energy, wind power, and customers asking lots of questions. What's the impact of this energy source? How much does it cost? How are we preparing for the future? We live in Portland, Oregon. People are asking lots of questions. So they had to learn how to be open with customers. Sounds familiar with healthcare, right? Very similar challenges, lots of learnings. We had the chief operating officer from New Seasons Market. This is a growing grocery store in mostly the Portland metropolitan area. They have 19 stores. Their motto, always say yes, how to make things right for customers. They told us a thing or two about really knowing your customer. What are their expectations? How are the stores in each of those very unique neighborhoods different? They have to really know their customers in those neighborhoods. Coincidentally, our medical clinics are right down the street from many of these grocery stores. How are we approaching that? Are we approaching it the same way as New Seasons? Do we know the expectations of those neighborhoods and those customers and those segments of people that visit our clinics and those grocery stores? And lastly, Twitter. We invited Twitter to come and speak to us, to us, and this was kind of when we were right in the throes of uh, integrating electronic medical record. And they, and so there was all this talk about big data and how we were going to use this. And Twitter reminded us we can really understand insights of small chunks of data, bite-sized tweets really help us understand the needs, the desires, and the values of groups of people. So my invitation to you is to take a step back. Learn from other industries. Bring the outside in. Now, in the last five years, I've only paid one speaker, and that was just travel expenses. So this can be done very nimbly. So I have been in healthcare for 24 years, and as we have been working with more and more community organizations, and we have also introduced in the last couple of years a venture team that's making investments in healthcare technologies, we've been working with new partners, and I realized I needed to get more knowledge about a different world that's more consumer-driven and often digital. So I decided to get a mentor, and I went to a venture capitalist in Portland. Pretty scary. <laughs> and one of the first things Diane said to me when we met, she said, Gwen, it will never be slower than it is today. Today is the slowest day <laughs> of your work life, right? Terrifying. Thank you very much, Diane. But it was the best thing that we needed at that point. We built this foundation with the speaker series and with the corporate challenges, and we were ready to start building the first and second floor. And I realized that I needed to have a SWAT team. And I wasn't going to be able to add additional staff to my team. So how are we going to do this? So I built an innovation fellowship team. And here's how it rolled out. I went to managers. Remember, we have this little engagement problem in healthcare. <laughs> so I knew they needed me as much as I needed them. And I asked managers, who are the one to two people on your teams that you're looking for to really help move Providence to be more relevant in the year 2025, that are gonna be helping create the new models, the new approaches that are gonna really help us relate and proactively respond to a very consumer-driven and digital world. They're gonna keep their day jobs, but I'm gonna provide some training for them. And it's gonna be training in human-centered design and understanding and value, understanding pain points of customers. 
and we're also gonna give them some funding so that they can test a solution with a small team and also with the business unit that's very motivated. And they're gonna tackle one of healthcare's biggest problems. In the first year, we had 21 fellows, and this year we have 19 fellows. The kinds of projects that we're tackling are things that will provide areas where we can make the biggest impact to help improve people's lives. We're partnering with paramedics. We're partnering with athletic trainers who are helping us with new programs to manage concussions. And we're working with new digital tools that help people manage their chronic conditions like diabetes or mild depression. In the first year, we created, we brought new models, new approaches to nearly 1,500 Oregonians. We partnered with over 15 community groups and technology companies. And our fellows, they're psychophysiologically aroused. Can you guys all say that? Psychophysiologically aroused. I'm gonna make Dr. Byrne really popular. I'm gonna have to meet her someday. So let's unpack one of these projects a little bit more so you can kind of see what we're, what we're going toward. This is our explanation of benefits, and we send out six and a half million of these paper copies to our health plan members a year. They're confusing. So we thought this is a major pain point for our members, and we can, this is something we can improve. So we used our skills in human-centered design and understanding value, and here's what we came up with. And here's some of the things that we learned. Keep it simple. Use simple visuals with color. Just like other industries, in the finance industry, we use these kind of visuals to show very complex information. It's simple, 75% of your deductible's been met. Use language that people understand and provide more ways to access it. Some people prefer really simple, big numbers, big pictures, big colors. But some people told us, you know, I really, this is financial information and it's something I feel like I need to document. I'd like a PDF, something that I can download and see the detail later. And others said, you know, I'd like to have the comfort of just having this be mobile and having it wherever I am. So the mobile option is, is there as well. So the lesson here, get going. Continue having setbacks. Get in a rhythm of change. Get ahead of it. Get ahead of mandates. Get ahead of all of that. Let's take it back to Shirley. When I go to visit Shirley, she has a countertop, a kitchen, full of health papers. It's just kind of the health care pile. <laughs> you probably have something similar. Mine has all different kinds of things on it. I don't know if they're all explanation of benefits, but I know they're health care information and they're probably just as confusing. Imagine if she had a simple way to access that in multiple forms that she could access that kind of information. So we've had a five-year journey building a foundation of inclusion with corporate challenges, a speaker series, and an innovation fellowship program. And Providence is part, in Oregon, is part of a growing organization that crosses now seven states and over 100,000 caregivers. So a big part of our journey will be expanding this program across all of the areas. And you can do this too, no matter how big or small your organization is. We won the day for Shirley and 30,000 other people with a kidney transplant. And now we need to win the journey for millions of people. 
And we can be successful with this by defining innovation that's inclusive, by inviting the outside in, and by just getting started. If we do these things, we win the journey. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.